We're going to let folks file in here, and we'll get started in just another minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Nashville. My name is Lisa Todd, and I am the chairman of the board of directors of the National MPS Society, and I am so excited to see a room full of people right here in the flesh in front of us. So welcome, everyone. I also want to welcome all of those that are uh, online watching this. We have a significant amount of individuals uh, that are able to watch this live. Um, electronically and uh, excited that in this whole new world we're able to provide and reach those who couldn't physically be here with us uh, this week. It's a historic week. Uh, this is, uh, as many of you know, our first in-person conference in over two years since we uh, were in Disney in 2019. And this is our largest in-person non-Disney conference in the history of the National MPS Society. So, well, very excited. We have over 500 attendees here with us uh, for the week, and so I encourage you all to uh, speak to one another, uh, engage in uh, those meaningful conversations in that community that we are so, so very fortunate and lucky to have. And so we have a significant amount of first time attendees. And so I encourage you all to uh, don't be shy. Uh, we're all family here and you'll quickly learn um, how we will uh, welcome you with open arms um, into our MPS community and family. We also uh, are so proud we were able to offer a historic amount of scholarships, um, which is near and dear to my heart, and a significant amount of those went to first-time attendees as well. So a record number um, of scholarships and offerings we were able to give to get uh, families here this week. So thank you for that, yes. Um, I just want to take a moment to, to thank our incredible National MPS Society staff members. As you can imagine, putting on a conference with this many people, and especially, uh, we, we did not anticipate such a large crowd, especially over the last uh, many, many weeks of uh, constant registration. They've had to pivot, work with the hotel to move rooms. Uh, you all received a communique when you uh, registered today, and that's because we did have to make some changes. Uh, because of our uh, large volume of, of attendees, which is so exciting, so I encourage you to take a look at that. So thank you to Terry and the entire team. 
Um, and a, just a round of applause for the National MPS Society staff. Thank you for long, long nights and weekends to get us here. Um, also, we would not be able to be here whatsoever without our incredible sponsors. You'll see them all listed um, in the program. Uh, there's tables outside. I encourage you to visit with all of them. Um, our scholarships and all the opportunities we're able to offer our members here are because of their generosity and their support. And so thank you so much to all of the sponsors. I mentioned it is a historic week, and so I just want to take a moment uh, to recognize a very monumental achievement that occurred uh, this year and, and officially uh, became uh, in the book, so to speak, as of yesterday. Um, newborn screening for MPS2 was uh, signed by uh, the secretary yesterday and officially, therefore, approved by uh, Department of Health and Human Services. This is a huge monumental achievement for the rare disease community um, and obviously for our MPS community and it is just one more uh, step in the right direction uh, towards treatments and cures uh, for, for our community. It gives me chills just saying that. So uh, this was a huge effort. It's very significant and a significant amount of work from a lot of stakeholders, a lot of them that I see in this room, a lot of put uh, a significant amount of time, blood, sweat, and tears, <laughs> literally, um, into getting it across the finish line and through committee. It's years of work, and again, it's just a catalyst. Uh, we are not done yet. There's a lot more work to do, but we should uh, celebrate um, such a, a large, achievement in getting that newborn screening officially on the National Arrest Panel. And therefore, there are many states that automatically adopt, and so we will be screening uh, this year uh, for MPS2 in, in many states, and we will continue to advocate uh, for many more states to adopt uh, that as well. So uh, thank you all uh, who helped with that. Big, big deal. Uh, one last quick announcement before uh, I introduce our amazing uh, first speaker today. Uh, this is a very important, well, actually, I have two more announcements. Um, quickly, we do have an overflow room. So the ballrooms just to the side here, there's some round tables, and we will be streaming uh, this. All the presentations in this main room will be streamed over there as overflow. So if you need more space um, to set up feel free to uh, watch any of the presentations over there as well. Um, and then also, uh, we did locate a single hearing aid um, outside here. Um, please see me or Terry. So if anyone is missing, uh, Matthew's holding it up. Um, we know these are very valuable, and so um, please pass the word around too if you hear anyone who's not hearing this message and is missing a hearing aid. Uh, we will we will be holding that um, for you. All right, and with that, um, I am going to introduce our first speaker uh, to kick us off for the conference today, which is Mark Sands. Mark um, is a rock. Yes. Oh. Technical adjustment here. One moment. Okay, great, thank you. So I will uh, introduce Mark. He's a rock star in our community and we're really excited to have him here today. Uh, Mark Sands is a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Genetics at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Since 1994, Dr. Sands has run an independent research laboratory with goals of better understanding the underlying pathogens and developing effective therapies for inherited childhood diseases, specifically lysosomal storage diseases. Dr. Sands performs most of the early preclinical pre experiments leading to the ultimate approval of enzyme therapy replacement for MPS7. Mark has a long resume, which you can also find in our program book. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Sands. Good 
everyone hear me? Cool. Um, well, thank you, Lisa. Um, and before I get started, I would very much like to extend a thank you to the National NPS Society for inviting me here. But for me, it goes much deeper than that. And uh, just to give you a very quick story, in 1994, the Society started offering postdoctoral fellowships as part of their, their funding opportunities. I was fortunate enough to get one of those fellowships. And for me, uh, this is in 1994, it really wasn't clear to me where my career was going, what I was going to be studying for the rest of my career. But this fellowship, which supported my salary for about a year or so, really helped solidify the decision in my mind to continue doing research on these diseases. And again, that was a long time ago, and I owe a huge debt of gratitude to the society. So thank you, all of you. Ta-da. So what I'd like to do today is divide this talk up into two, uh, two basic parts. The first is to give you a very uh, superficial overview of where we are today with respect to various therapeutic approaches and how we got to where we are today. And then for the second half, uh, basically give you my, my opinions on where I think things should go, what progress is being made, and what the future holds for uh, developing therapies for these disorders. Okie dokie. Okay, which button am I supposed to push? Okay, that's what I pressed. Okay, computers don't like me. I don't like them either, so that's okay. Um, so before I start talking about uh, the science, I really would be remiss in not acknowledging the contributions of people who came before, before me. And I'd like to acknowledge three people today, Liz Neufeld, Stuart Kornfeld, and Bill Sly. Uh, between these three scientists, they really um, established the foundation by which most of the therapies we're developing today are based on. Liz Neufeld first described what's referred to as cross-correction back in the late 1960s. And then Stuart and Bill uh, really dissected in very, very fine detail the mechanisms involved in cross-correction and how to, how to exploit that to try to develop the therapies that we have today. So again, these three um, are really, uh, really giants in the field and deserve a lot of credit for where we are today. So where are we today? So I'll start with enzyme replacement therapy. So when I started on this journey way back in 1990, I was a postdoctoral fellow at the Jackson Laboratory working with Ed Birkenmeyer, and Ed had just discovered the MPS7 mouse. So Ed and I got together and we set up a collaboration with Bill Sly to ask the simple question, could recombinant enzyme replacement therapy actually be effective for MPS7? So we performed a relatively simple-minded experiment, and we'd, we identified MPS7 mice on the day of birth and began giving them intravenous injections weekly for about six weeks and then analyzed the animals after that. And the results were truly striking. Um, what we saw, first of all, was, okay, nothing's going to work for me today. <laughs> all right, I'll just walk you through it. That's okay. Uh, if you look at the lower left, those are histologic slides showing the liver. At the far left, you can see what looks like holes. That's the lysosomal storage material. That's the pathology, okay? If you look at the next slide over, that's a section of liver after these animals received multiple intravenous injections of enzyme, okay? The disease seems to be cleared. But even more striking, when we look at the, I didn't mean to break it, I really didn't. Cool. Um, when we look at the whole animal, though, the, the results were even more striking. If you look at the animals on the right, the animal on the left is an untreated MPS7 animal. It has a very distinctive phenotype or appearance. The animal on the far right 
is its litter mate, a normal animal. And you can see the dramatic difference between a normal animal and an MPS7 animal. The animal in the middle is also an MPS7 animal, but it received multiple intravenous injections starting at birth. And again, it's striking. And we dug down in the weeds on this, and we, we analyzed these animals, and we showed that their visual function, their hearing function, their bone development, all of this was dramatically improved. It was really, again, very striking. I'm sure I can break this too. Let me see. <laughs> no, not yet. OK. This is the MPS7 animal that received multiple injections of enzyme. Again, very striking. And we were very excited about that. Well, then, at almost the exact same time, Liz Neufeld and Bob Scholl were doing a similar experiment in the canine model, so the dog model of MPS1. And again, very simple, very similar experiment. Intravenous injections in this dog model of MPS1, and they showed very similar results. So for example, if you look at sections of the liver, you see all this disease here. Following enzyme replacement, the liver looked much normal. Now, this study is significant for two reasons. The first reason is that what we saw in MPS7 was not unique to MPS7. So in other words, this may actually, enzyme replacement may actually work across multiple MPS disorders. And this is good proof that, in fact, it might. Okay? The second really important uh, significance of this study was one of scale. Mice are only this big. Okay? And a dog and children are orders of magnitude larger. The question is, can you scale this up? Okay? It's one thing to treat a mice. And don't get me wrong, I love my mice. They're very adorable and everything. But it's a serious question. Can you scale it up? And again, these data strongly suggest that, in fact, you could. Okay. And then, to follow up on that, Liz Neufeld and Emil Pekakis did the first clinical trial of enzyme replacement for an MPS disorder. That was MPS1. And they showed some very dramatic and promising results. And this ultimately led to FDA approval of ERT for MPS1 in 2003. And of course, that was the first enzyme replacement therapy approved for an MPS disorder. Now, since that time, of course, many different groups have done work with uh, many of the MPS disorders looking, for en looking at enzyme replacement. And now we have FDA approved enzyme replacement for five different MPS disorders. MPS 1, 6, 2, 4A, and 7. And there are ongoing clinical trials to try to get uh, enzyme replacement approved for other MPS disorders. So this has come a long way since we started this back about 30 years ago. OK, what about gene therapy? We've all heard about gene therapy. And there's two significant differences between gene therapy and enzyme replacement. Uh, but there's also a commonality. The common thread here is that the fundamental mechanism by which gene therapy and enzyme replacement work, which is cross-correction, that's common to both. The difference is with enzyme replacement where you're giving an exogenous source of enzyme intravenously, in gene therapy what we're trying to do is genetically modify the cells in a patient so that that patient now produces its own enzyme. It can be secreted from the genetically modified cells and then provide a systemic source and a persistent source of enzyme. The other major difference is, which all of you in the room know, enzyme replacement requires repeated injections for the, the, the patient's life. Gene therapy, at least in principle, could be a one-time treatment. Okay? And I say in principle because we've yet to prove that yet, but in principle, it could be a one-shot uh, one shot therapy. Now, back when I started this back in 1990, uh, due to technical issues, basically nothing was working in gene therapy. Okay? But it wasn't until the mid to late 1990s where two gene transfer vectors were, two different platforms were developed, which completely revolutionized the whole, the whole field. One is adeno-associated viral vectors, and I'll talk about that in a minute, and then lentiviral vectors. The development of these two technologies, again, has transformed how we think about and how we do gene therapy. So what about adeno-associated viral vectors? So we started working with them back in the mid-1990s, 
And again, we did really what's a, a very simple-minded experiment. We identified MPS7 mice the day they were born and gave them, a, gave them a single intravenous injection of an AAV vector the day they were bored, born, did nothing else to them, and then analyzed them later. And very much like what we saw with enzyme replacement, the, the results were truly striking. Very much like, like enzyme replacement, when you look at the, the disease in each cell, it was completely prevented. And again, I say prevent in this case because we started this in newborn animals. Okay, so we're not reversing disease, we're preventing the onset. Okay, and these are neurons in the brain, but I can tell you that if you look in liver, spleen, heart, it looks the same. The disease was prevented. But again, when you actually look at the animals, again, you see these very striking results. The animal in the middle is an untreated MPS7 animal. Animal on the right is its litter mate, so age matched, normal animal. This animal on the left, though, is also an MPS7 animal and received a single injection of virus the day it was born. Okay? And again, when we dig down in the weeds and we really analyze these animals very carefully, their visual function is improved, their auditory function is improved, skeletal development is improved. These animals were really very, very good. Okay? Again, very encouraging. We were very excited by this. Well, shortly after that, from the laboratory of Chet Whitley and Scott MacGyver, they did a virtually identical experiment, but this time they did it in the mouse model of MPS1. Okay? Again, virtually identical experiment. Identify the animals at birth, give them a single intravenous injection of virus, and analyze them later. You see the disease, all these bubbles here in the liver, completely gone. And again, they also showed that the skeletal development was better. The pathology in the eye, in the ear, all of this was better. Again, the significance of this is that what we discovered in the MPS7 animal was not unique or not limited to MPS7. Again, strongly suggesting that this may work across multiple MPS disorders. Okay, well then there's the brain. And everyone in the audience now knows at this point that the brain disease is one of the most difficult parts of this, or one of the most difficult aspects of these diseases to treat, okay? So almost simultaneously, there was, within one year, there was three independent groups that did an experiment where they took an adeno-associated viral vector, very much like what I just described, and injected it directly into the brains of mice with MPS7. You know, these are adult animals in this particular case, so they were asking the question, can you reverse the pathology in the brain with an adeno-associated viral vector or by gene therapy? And uniformly, their, their results were virtually identical. In fact, if you inject AAV in the brain, you get high-level expression, and the lysosomal storage material is essentially eliminated throughout the brain. So again, very exciting. It doesn't work just systemically. It can also work in the central nervous system. So we took that one step further, though. We took an, our adeno-associated viral vector and we injected it into the brains of a newborn MPS7 animal to ask the question whether we could prevent the onset of disease. And in fact, we could. If you look at all this lysosomal storage material here, it's completely eliminated here. But we ask the additional question, can we prevent the cognitive deficits associated with MPS7? So without going into all the gory details of how you do behavioral tests in a mice, um, the MPS7 animals that receive intracranial injections of AAV were absolutely indistinguishable from their wild-type age-matched counterparts. Okay? This was very exciting to us. Not only could we prevent the, patho the pathologic aspects, we could prevent the cognitive deficits as well. Okay? It was very exciting to us. And then, shortly after that, out of Mark Haskins' laboratory from the University of Pennsylvania, he did a similar experiment, but this time in the canine model of MPS7, where he took an adeno-associated viral vector and injected it directly into the brains. And what he showed was that all the lysosomal storage material, which in this particular slide you can see by this brown staining, that lysosomal storage material was almost completely eliminated following that. And again, just like enzyme replacement, the significance of this was one of scale.
can you scale something up? And it's not just scaling up a little bit. Again, mice are tiny. Dogs and children are orders of magnitude larger than a mouse. And scale is a real issue. Can it be scaled up? This would suggest that, in fact, it can. OK. So that's endo-associated viral vectors. And that's gene therapy, what, what I will call direct gene therapy. So delivering a vector directly to a patient. But there's also what we call ex vivo gene therapy, where you can take a patient's own cells. And what I'm going to talk about are bone marrow stem cells. Okay. Take a patient's own stem cells out of their body, genetically modify them in a dish, and then transplant them back into the patient, where hopefully they will then graft, express high levels of enzyme, and then provide a systemic response. This is difficult to model in a mouse, but I had a very talented MD-PhD student who was getting his PhD thesis in my lab, and he devised a unique model of MPS7. It's called the xenotransplantation model of MPS7. And what that means, it's really very simple. This mouse model has MPS7, okay, so it has the genetic disease. But it's manipulated in such a way that if you take human cells and transplant it into that mouse, those cells are not rejected by the mouse. So now we have a chance to ask the question, can we take human hematopoietic stem cells that are deficient in an enzyme, genetically modify them outside the body, and transplant them into a meaningful model of disease and, and see whether it can correct the disease? In fact, it can. So first thing Alex asked was, do the, do the human cells persist in the animal, and do they distribute widely and express the therapeutic enzyme? All these red dots here, these are the human cells brought, derived from an MPS7 patient, and they were genetically modified and now overexpressing the therapeutic enzyme. They distribute widely throughout the body. And they also eliminate this lysosomal storage material in multiple tissues of the body. So this was very exciting to us. And again, it suggested that we potentially could do this in humans. Now I'm going to take a second here and step away from the science and talk about the Miranda family. Um, the Miranda family is really, they were a very courageous family. They allowed us to isolate Jason's hematopoietic stem cell. So Jason was a young man who had MPS7, and they allowed us to isolate his bone marrow stem cells, genetically modify them, and do the experiment that I just described. Okay. Without that, we couldn't have done the experiment. And they volunteered for this, knowing, first of all, that it was not going to harm Jason, but second of all, knowing that it also was not going to help Jason. Okay. They just wanted to see the research go forward. So they, uh, the Miranda family and families like them, like you, are very important for this research. So the experiment I just talked about, this ex vivo hematopoietic directed gene therapy, was that simply an academic exercise that we performed, or can this actually work? Well, just last year, in November of 2021, an Italian group published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine showing that, in fact, it can work. They did virtually the identical technique that we did previously, now in children with Hurler syndrome. And what they showed is that the, the benefit was at least as good, if not better, than bone marrow transplant. But importantly, because they were using the patient's own cells and transplanting them back in, you essentially eliminate this, this issue called graft-versus-host disease, which can actually lead to fatal complications. So it's a major advance for ex vivo hematopoietic directed gene therapy for these disorders. OK, so again, just a superficial brief overview of where we are and how we got to where we are. So what's next? First thing I'd like to talk about is an experiment or a discovery that Stuart Kornfeld made just recently. And again, Stuart is one of those pioneers, and he's been studying this phenomenon of cross-correction and how to actually 
manipulate it. So he's been studying, so cross-correction is the uptake of cells, or the uptake of these recombinant enzymes by cells. The only way the enzyme can be taken up is if those enzymes are properly phosphorylated. Okay? And what that means is there's a, a small phosphate molecule that's attached to the enzymes. It binds to the receptor and allows them to be taken up. If that phosphate is not there, these cells are not taken up efficiently, and enzyme replacement is not very effective. So Stewart was actually studying the enzyme that puts the phosphate on the lysosomal enzyme. And what he was able to do he actually made, he actually re-engineered that whole protein. It's a very large protein, it's a large gene, it's hard to work with. So he understood it well enough that he was able to re-engineer it into a much smaller version of the protein. And the size matters, and I'll tell you about the size in a minute, why that matters. But importantly, this re-engineered smaller version is also more efficient at phosphorylating lysosomal enzymes than the native enzyme is, okay? So if you look, for example, if you simply focus on these couple bars here, if you look at the gray bar, that's how much phosphate or how much phosphorylation occurs on that lysosomal enzyme from the native enzyme, okay? So that's normal. The black bar shows the increase in phosphorylation from this re-engineered re protein. It's a very large increase. And in principle, the more phosphorylation you have, the more efficient, the more efficient enzyme replacement will be, okay? And in this initial paper, Stuart only showed three enzymes, but I know Stuart very well. He's actually in the building right next to me. And they've looked at a lot of different enzymes now, many of which that are involved in the MPS disorders. You see the same increase in phosphorylation if you use this re-engineered enzyme on those, okay? So what's the significance? Again, some of these lysosomal enzymes are very poorly phosphorylated. And the, the, the main example I think of is N-acetylglucosaminidase, the enzyme responsible for MPS3B. Very, very poorly phosphorylated. Now, potentially, if we can increase the phosphorylation on that enzyme, now enzyme replacement may, may work much more efficiently. It's also possible, the results aren't in yet, these experiments are currently underway, but it's also possible that if you increase the phosphorylation, you may get a broader distribution of these enzymes. So in other words, some of these difficult to treat tissues, heart, bones, possibly even the brain, perhaps increased phosph phosphorylation may allow these enzymes to be more efficient. Uh, in treating the disease. And also, remember I told you that this re-engineered protein is smaller. So the gene is smaller as well, okay? So what, who cares? These gene therapy vectors that I talked to you about before, the adeno-associated viral vectors, the lenti vectors, you can only fit so much DNA in those vectors, and size becomes a problem. And in fact, the native enzyme, this phosphotransferase, is too big to fit into any of those vectors. This re-engineered gene now fits. So now, this opens up the possibility, or at least provides a conceptual framework by which we can start <coughs> thinking about treating a disease, for example, like mucolipidosis 2. In mucolipidosis 2, the enzyme that's deficient is actually the phosphotransferase. And conceptually, we didn't even know how to think about treating this disease. With Stewart's discovery, at least again, we now have the conceptual framework of how, how we might be able to do that. Okay, so we get back to the brain. The brain is a problem, okay? Most of the MPS disorders have some neurologic component, and unless we treat that, the therapies are not gonna be very effective, okay? But we have this pesky thing called the blood-brain barrier, which it's a double-edged sword. The blood-brain barrier is very, very important. It protects us from pathogenic viruses, bacteria, <laughs> noxious chemicals. It keeps all those things out of our brain. Unfortunately, the blood-brain barrier does not discriminate between a pathogenic virus and the therapeutic virus we're trying to give or a recombinant enzyme that we're trying to give. It's a very, very impenetrable barrier. It's hard to overcome, okay? So, 
there's an enormous amount of research going on on how to basically trick the blood-brain barrier into letting things in, okay? And I don't have time during this talk to go into all of these details, but there was a re review article very recently, 2020, by Toriyuki Okayama, who actually was a postdoc in my lab many years ago. He now is an independent laboratory, and he wrote a review article basically describing what's the research that's being done to try to modify various enzymes for various MPS disorders, again, to try to get these enzymes across the blood-brain barrier, okay? So again, I don't have time to talk about all this. If you're interested, this is a very good review. I would encourage you to, to take a look at it. Okay, what about gene therapy? I've already told you sort of where we are currently. So what's, what's up next, okay? I've already talked about the adeno-associated viral vectors, the lentiviral vectors for ex vivo delivery. AAV is usually used for direct gene therapy. But no discussion on gene therapy, especially the future of gene therapy, would be complete without talking about the gene targeting technologies. That would be CRISPR, zinc finger nucleases, talons, those sorts of technologies. So now, we now can actually think about the possibility of correcting a defective gene, okay? Before, the gene, the, all the gene transfer technology that I talked about earlier in the talk, all of that involved delivering a functional copy of the gene to a patient so they can make their own enzyme. But that functional copy would be put in just randomly. We have no control over where those things go, okay? And that each time one of those genes integrates, it's a mutation there can be some very serious consequences to that. So now with gene targeting, we now may have the ability to, again, not only correct a defective gene, but probably more appropriately for these diseases, actually insert a functional gene, a very strong gene, in what we call a safe harbor. Okay. So the human genome is enormous, okay? And there are vast regions of the genome that's sort of like no man's land. Okay, lots and lots of DNA, but there are no genes in there, no regulatory elements, no genes. So in those, what we call safe harbors, you could think about inserting a functional copy of a gene without disrupting any other genes that may cause a secondary disease. So in my opinion, that's really where the strength of this is, okay, trying to target things into safe harbors. But, there are still challenges ahead of us, okay? And from my perspective, one of the main challenges or issues is safety, okay? There's still some issues with safety that we just don't understand. It needs a lot more research, and there's a lot of research going on in that respect. But there's other challenges, for example, cargo size. How big a gene can we put in these vectors? Can we target enough cells? Can we target the correct cells? There's lots and lots of research that it needs to happen, which is ongoing right now. But I will say that the future, in my opinion at least, is extremely bright uh, to solve some of these issues. And then rational combination therapies. As I've tried to point out, we now have a growing toolbox of treatments that are really, some of them can be quite effective, but none of them are cures. None of these treatments are a cure yet. And some of these therapies, there's often quite a bit of overlap between what these individual therapies can treat, but there's also areas where they don't overlap, okay? So you could easily imagine taking several different therapies, combining them, and you basically get the both, best of both worlds. You get the areas that overlap from a therapeutic perspective, but then those, those targets that don't overlap, you also get those. And if we're lucky, you would get a response then that is either additive or if we're really, really lucky, possibly even a synergistic interaction between these various therapies, okay? And it's not too hard to imagine a whole bunch of different combinations, ERT plus transplantation, substrate reduction therapy, chaperones. And I didn't have time to talk about these, but this the research is moving forward very well also. And again, you can easily imagine any number of combinations in the future. So does this work in reality? 
So we did an experiment very shortly after we started working with enzyme replacement back in the 90s. We asked the simple question, can we combine enzyme replacement with bone marrow transplantation and what kind of effects do you get? So we did that in the MPS7 mouse and in fact, the response we got was, as we had hoped, in fact, was additive. So the, the extra benefits we get from enzyme replacement that you don't get from transplant, now when you combine them, you get the whole package, okay? And this has also been done uh, out of uh, University of Minnesota, Paul Orchard's group. They've combined enzyme replacement with bone marrow transplant for Hurler syndrome as well. And there's a lot more research going on on these various combination therapies. So what I'd like to close with is not so much a technical advance, okay? Because technically, you know, things are moving forward on the gene therapy front, enzyme replacement, small molecule drugs. Those technologies are moving forward. In this particular case, I personally think one of the strongest uh, areas to move forward on is early intervention, okay? We all know that these are progressive diseases, okay? And it just makes sense. If you intervene early and try to prevent the onset of disease, it should be more effective than trying to reverse pre-existing disease. Just makes sense. And there are experimental data that certainly support that. So, you just heard some good news earlier about the RUSP, or what's called the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, newborn screening. There's good news and there's bad news here. The good news is we have FDA-approved enzyme replacement therapy for five MPS disorders, okay? My slide is out of date already by about 15 minutes, which actually, I appreciate that. Yep. The bad news is up until just a few minutes ago, there was only one MPS disorder listed on the RUSP. That's a shame, absolute shame. Um, well, again, it's out of date. MPS2 is now on the RUSP, that's good, but there are at least three additional MPS disorders that aren't on the RUSP. They should be treated when they're born, okay? Um, I think this is a very, um, this is an area where I think the society and individuals can make a huge impact. And from a therapeutic perspective, it'll have even a bigger impact if you can treat early on. Now, this is my last slide. I'm sure I've overrun time and I apologize. I borrowed this slide from Tippy McKenzie. I'm not sure you can see that, but uh, you'll be able to find her. Speaking of early intervention, this is taking even one step back from newborn screening. Dr. McKenzie has a clinical trial uh, ongoing where there, she's doing in utero enzyme replacement therapy for several MPS disorders. Now, there's several really important advantages to this. The first, of course, is this prevention versus reversal. It'd be great to intervene during a newborn period. It would be even better to intervene earlier, okay? But the other major advantage is the possibility that if you intervene in utero, you may actually tolerize these children to this enzyme. So what do I mean by tolerize? Most of you in the audience who have a child on enzyme replacement, you know that there's an issue with the development of antibodies once in, if enzyme replacement is started after birth. If you start earlier, you may be able to tolerize those children. In other words, those children now recognize that enzyme as what we call self, and they may not develop antibodies to that recombinant enzyme. Or if they do, the reactions may be less severe. So there's several really, really important aspects to this in utero enzyme replacement therapy. And again, early intervention, uh, again, we can have the best therapies in the world. Unless you deliver it early to try to prevent the onset, it's only gonna have limited efficacy. Okay. And with that, I think I'll stop. Um, I think the future is incredibly bright, I'm very excited. And acknowledgements, of course, first and foremost, all of you. 
But then, for me personally, the society helped launch my career. Uh, independent foundations, NIH, and then of course all the researchers, postdocs, students, technicians, all the people that make me look good, they deserve the credit. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a very timely presentation and those end remarks. Um, we are going to have a little bit of time for Q&A after our next speaker. So if you do have questions uh, for Dr. Sands, we can get to those shortly. Um, our next speaker, I'm uh, pleased to introduce um, also a, a familiar face to many of our families, um, Dr. Paul Harmatz. Uh, Paul Harmatz is a professor in residence at the Department of Pediatrics, University of California, San Francisco, and UCFS Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland, where he also is a medical director of the Pediatric Clinical Research Program in MPS and Related Disorders. During the last 20 years, Dr. Harmatz has participated in clinical trials developing therapies for MPS-1, 2, 3A, 3B, 4A, 6, and 7, and has managed clinical care for many, many of our MPS patients living in Northern California and beyond. I know a lot to uh, travel to see him as well. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Harmetz. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a very kind invitation. Um, I can tell you that Dr. Sands and I did not coordinate our talks, but you will hear a clinician's um, viewpoint on virtually all of the concepts that he discussed and um, reinforcement and uh, em emphasis may be the best outcomes. So I'm a gastroenterologist by training. And um, I always like to start by saying that, please, any hard questions should go to my mentors, Joe Munzer or Barbara Burton. And <laughs> after 20 years, Joe's probably not going to let me do this much longer. In our first early 2000s, we were talking about the original ERT trials, and Lauren Clark would speak first, Joe second, and MPS6 would be third, and so I could figure most of the questions had been already dissipated. And um, so, so I'm located in the in the Bay Area. It's it's always been a very attractive spot. It helps me with recruiting. Um, the climate is good. It was harder for Bert, Barbara to bring people to Chicago, so <laughs> she always functioned at a disadvantage on that on that front. But um, it's been an amazing 20 years. And Mark started five or six years earlier. I started around 2000, and I'm older, so I probably won't see the next 10 years that you just described with the excitement that's coming. So I have, I've worked with many of the sponsors that are here and earlier sponsors, and they, um, they, they really have driven the type of studies that I've done. I haven't done the preclinical work, but have sort of benefited from what Mark's done. Sponsors have taken over and then taken to clinical trials. So, so in the talk, I, I do want to mention the first 50 years, people ignore the fact that uh, a huge amount of beautiful work was done in the early 1900s up until 1970 uh, describing the diseases. And the second 50 years really are the therapy years, the, the ERT years that um, 
and the golden age of ERT, which has been the last 20 years. And then give you my perspective, most of the clinical direction, the, the treatment directions that Mark mentioned or will mention, and then finish again with the Tippy McKinsey's project. Um, I've been able to work really closely with her and help her with the the MPS part and Priya Kishnani um, helped a lot with the uh, the Pompeii um, end of the the picture. But I can sort of fill in the excitement with the first patient that came through that that trial. So this is. Uh, doesn't, I don't need to introduce to, to all of you the, the family of MPS patients that we have. And these are almost all of the patients were people we had seen in Oakland except for uh, the Hurler patients, although um, Ryan Dent is well known to everybody and is on the picture. Um, the, the handsome gentleman in the second slide, you can recognize Joe Munzer 15 years ago. He's giving a lecture with, with one of our MPS patients. And, um, and then a, a more Keo patient uh, who we had in a natural history trial. Uh, you can see he has somewhere between classical and non-classical disease. He actually was um, mobile and employed until his probably mid-30s uh, and then had to retire and was is dependent on a wheelchair. He's the father of a very um, beautiful boy, and he has a wonderful life. But uh, you, can, you can see that his disease is quite different from uh, the disease a hurler patient will have. And then one of our most difficult diseases, we still don't have a therapy, are the MPS3. And we have a, one of our young ladies in that uh, picture in the lower right who was in a clinical trial. Um, and finally, MPS-6, which is the disease I used to think everybody with MPS was like MPS-6 patients. And it took me another 10 years to, to really understand the, the brain disease that, that we're being challenged with now. But here we, we show the, the sort of wide distribution of, of uh, phenotypes we have a very slowly progressing intermediate, rapidly progressing patient. He, this patient is, uh, was in the natural history. He wouldn't qualify for a clinical trial. The nuances of each of the trials are that um, for the patients without a, a neurologic component, the trials were focused on rapidly progressing severe patients. And when we moved to MPS 1 and 2, it, we had to focus on the more attenuated patients that were able to do the functional testing that was required. But he's a nuclear uh, engine, nuclear sub submarine propulsion engineer, so he has uh, really um, uh, gone through a lot of college masters and sophisticated training. Uh, middle uh, uh, lady was a forest. Service, uh, um, U.S. Forest Service in the state of Washington, fire control, um, sort of wilderness uh, fire. She wasn't a firefighter herself. That would have been uh, uh, really challenging because they still have significant mobility and, uh, and, and skeletal disease as part of their MPS. And then most of you know um, Kendra, who's quite you know, one of our first trial patients, and she's in her late 30s now. I won't give her age exactly. Um, I'll probably be wrong if I guess 37. But she's at a, she works full time as a clinic uh, designing programs with um, uh, patients with various handicaps at the University of South Dakota. She's written two books. She heads a, um, a clothing line for patients with MPS. So you, um, and she also would not be alive without enzyme replacement therapy. It was, and we'll describe the survey study that d demonstrated uniquely that um, patients with a certain level of gag 
um, at a, were not surviving beyond the age of 20. So this, this was the breakthrough, is recognizing here's a biomarker that could predict clinical outcome. So I know there are many other of my MPS6 patients in the audience, and I wish I had pictures of all of them, but um, I've got Patricia here, and I think Isabel is in another part of the, the room. So. so the first 50 years, you have to realize that, that describing and recognizing these diseases before we knew anything about what's the storage material, um, how do we detect it, uh, is it, are all the diseases the same storage material? took very astute clinicians uh, to identify these diseases. These are the years they were described, 1917 to 1973. Slyes was the last, and uh, Mark described working closely with Bill Sly as his, one of his mentors. But these were really uh, important steps forward. Then the pathology, seeing the storage material, characterizing it, uh, recognizing that that material was a mucopolysaccharide and could be found in urine, looking at the pattern of that material in the urine and seeing it was different for the different diseases. So suddenly these people taught us that th there are different forms of this, th these diseases that are probably um, unique, even though clinically they had already tried to separate them. And then Liz Neufeld and Gideon Bach was working with Liz Neufeld also. They finally um, demonstrated cross-correction and demonstrated that a specific enzyme, first one with hydronitase, um, was characterized. And we were off and running in the 1970s. So I could hand this slide to Emil Kakis tomorrow. We know that, that Liz will be presented with an award uh, tomorrow. And um, she is really the grand dame of this whole field. And cross-correction was the breakthrough that, that let us move through the process of stem cell transplant, which is still mostly cr cross-correction and uh, the development of enzyme replacement therapy. Mark may correct me, but there, there is the story that a postdoc accidentally mixed Hurler and Hunter cells by mistake in the laboratory and then noticed that all of the storage, those granules that Mark described were gone and Liz was sharp enough not to throw it out as a mixed up experiment and recognize that she had a breakthrough uh, piece of information. These two gentlemen were the originators of um, MPS trans stem cell transplant, uh, John Hobbs in the UK and Bill Crivet at um, University of Minnesota and um, really started the field. It was aggressive therapy. It was the, at the beginning, the mortality was high and, and um, the benefit was yet to be proven, but they moved forward, and um, especially University of Minnesota and a couple of large groups in the UK have, and uh, the Netherlands have been able to protocolize it in a way that it has a dramatically reduced um, toxicity and, and is being used for MPS-1 as the standard of care at this point. Emil Kakis was the um, took the giant step, and this, this Mark mentioned this trial that he ran, and this was his first patient that he had in the trial, and, and he did this at Harbor UCLA, also a West Coast uh, program. Liz Neufeld by that point was at UCLA, Emil was at Harbor UCLA, he was, he, I'm sure you've all heard uh, Mark Dent's st stories of manufacturing was a week or two ahead. They were trying to keep up with the clinical trial patients and Emil was really struggling and BioWarin stepped in and provided the funding to complete that trial and then 
moved on to partner with Genzyme to develop, uh, to move to the phase three trials. <laughs> Mark gave you a lot of in insight about how important preclinical studies are, and without them, you can't move to a clinical trial, and it would be very unlikely to get through FDA approval in order to have an IND to, to do a trial without good animal work. It helps. There's been great work out of mice, but as Mark said, the large animal models are really critically important. And I can show you the, the, the model that was used before the MPS-6 trial was the, um, the cat, and it was in John Hopwood's lab in Australia in Adelaide where all of the preclinical work in the cat taught us that early treatment was better, the, it gave the approximate dose, it looked at how to suppress the immune response so the, the cats would tolerate human enzyme. Uh, in the cat, they also did look at a feline enzyme they were able to manufacture, so it, there is a, it's better to be with your own species, but it could be, you could cross and still do the trials. So you can see the the affected cat has a very flat forehead and short ears and then treated it's much improved, much closer to the head structure of a um, of a uh, uh, normal cat. And there have been detailed looks at the bone developments improved, the joints are better, the um, survival was better, so it, it really was critical at getting um, into trial. Then, as Mark said, production is uniquely hard, and John Hopwood tried with two companies to start trials in Australia for MPS-6. He lost 10 years and a large number of Australian patients that didn't survive that time period, and they just couldn't solve the production problems. And when it got transferred to Biomarin or licensed by Biomarin, they were able to, to work out the production problems. And um, Amylcacus had a big hand in, in those steps. And it was even then the challenge, I later learned the, that there were challenges and we were, you know, they were worried about enzyme being available a month down from where we were in the trial. But Stu, this is introducing Stu Sweedler, who was the vice president of clinical trials at Biomarin at the time. And he he led this trial beautifully. He, I'll show you a schedule how we moved through, tri, through the three stages in a five-year period. But between phase one and two, he set up a survey study that was involved um, about 100 patients, which we estimated, he estimated, as 10% of the world population. So it gave a true picture of the disease, and that was critical in uh, convincing FDA to move ahead and allow us to, uh, to move through a phase three and get approval. And it was remarkable, the demonstration of the three phenotypes, there's a little bit of an intermediate, a lot of rapidly progressing and a slowly progressing form, the differences in um, uh, urine gag levels and the difference in sur age and survival in those groups of patients. So you need preclinical, you need natural history or at least cross-sectional understanding and you need biomarkers that can be sold uh, to FDA to support support the trials. So this just shows you the survival data and you're seeing age in years across, and there, there are older patients with MPS-6, but what you see is that all of their urine gags are below this line of around 100. Then you move 200 and above and it's almost unheard of to have maybe a few patients just cross the 20 year range but except for this one patient, they're all young. And it doesn't prove that we can't find it, but it was really suggestive that this, this was, had to be 
started early, it was a lethal disease, and we had a chance to see if we could prolong life in these patients. A resurvey came 10 years later and did show that even though it wasn't, the groups were not well balanced, it did, uh, was significant that survival was better in the treated group. So looking at the time frame, we started around 2000, 2001, finished in 2005, and um, it was, this has been sort of traditional. It looked like this for MPS1, MPS2. It's really efficient, and you, if you, the, the sponsors are uh, well organized and, and have clear endpoints, and it's much easier to have endpoints that are peripheral, not neurologic. This, these, this was sort of a golden time period. So just highlighting the, the lead people in each of these studies and the drugs that were produced and the different sponsors, the different companies, and it was a huge partnership between industry and the basic science and the lead clinicians. Uh, that were active in each of these areas. I added, it's, it's important to, to look at Asia because there have been developments with enzyme in Asia. Most people don't appreciate that Korea has an enzyme for MPS2, it's called Hunter Ace, um, and um, it hasn't moved into phase three trials in the US. Unfortunately, it probably won't, but it, it is approved in Korea. It's marketed in 12 com countries, and um, it actually is approved and marketed in China. So it's going to reach a huge number of, of patients in that setting. So I started in 2000. We we had a lot of supportive care. We only had one way of giving specific enzyme. 20 years later, we as Mark was describing, we have um, uh, five or six, uh, <laughs> it's got a mind of its own, okay. One, two, four, a six and seven, FDA approved, but Hunter Ace approved um, uh, in Korea and, and China and and marketed in other countries. I don't have a list. And then there's a approval for Hunter Ace to be given ICV in the ventricle in Japan. That's uh, an active treatment um, program in there, that setting. And um, then there's the IV ERT blood brain penetrating enzyme that's, that was developed in, in Japan is approved and marketed in Japan and now in trials in the US. We still have challenges. Enzymes are expensive. They require weekly treatment. We have an immune response. We haven't uh, settled on a therapy to overcome it or um, uh, should we be uh, immune tolerizing every patient that's going on enzyme therapy. Uh, the clear, it's not clear that it's the same um, uh, need that we have in Pompeii disease. Skeletal disease doesn't respond well. Um, the uh, newborn screening programs were slow to be initiated. It's been five years since we had uh, approval for MPS, um, actually six years for MPS-1. If it takes us six years for the next MPS, It'll be 30 years before we finish all the MPS. And it, as Mark said, the treatments are really essential early. It's also, uh, you would really like to have patients in trials for neurologic disease before the disease has progressed. And probably newborn screening will be the only way that that, that will happen effectively. So I, I'll just highlight, and some of it you've already heard from, from Mark, but uh, three of the therapies uh, that are, uh, and it, there are other areas like Mark was mentioning, there's anti-inflammatory, there's substrate reduction that uh, was close to being in trial uh, from Inventiva. Um, that program got tabled by the company, but 
there's always a hope that somebody will pick it up. But um, uh, the direct intrathecal or intraventricular administration is, uh, is, uh, has been used for three, three of the uh, major trials. And Joe Munzer led the trial for uh, intrathecal with Shire. Um, it was uh, a really uh, ambitious, uh, uh, it moved through a phase three, it didn't meet its endpoint. It had um, uh, significant benefit in specific age groups and populations, but uh, the uh, decision was not to pursue regulatory approval. ICV is a different route of administration I actually don't know the dose, whether it's higher than the Eloprase, so Joe may have an answer for that. Um, it is approved in Japan, and then Biomarin, now Alivex, um, have a MPS3 enzyme that's, that's used ICV and that we have in trials. Um, so this was the group that worked on the ICV, uh, Jun Kiso, and the, or, or Young Bay Sun on the bottom, Dr. Okiyama, Dr. Jin, Korea, South Korea leading um, MPS physician, and Dr. Okiyama, the, one of the two or three leading physicians in Japan. The other big push with enzyme is the blood brain barrier uh, transporting. Mark mentioned this. We have two, two trials that are active in the in the U.S., we have JCR, we have Denali. Um, they both uh, uh, are going simultaneously. They uh, have slightly different inclusion, exclusion, and design issues. So you may qualify based on age, for instance, for one trial, not the other trial. Uh, so um, we have significant published evidence with JCR that it's effective. Denali has press release and abstract presentations that looked really nice, and you know we're we're excited. We wish you know we hope that both get approved, um, even though that may ne not be possible at least in the U.S. with our regulatory system. But it's exciting to have these these opportunities, and then gene therapy. Mark mentioned that there are two types to focus on. One is I, I organize them a little bit differently than Mark did. I separate them as in vivo and ex vivo. In vivo are the AAV packages that, that Mark mentioned. They can be given IV, they can be given intrathecal, they can be given intraventricular. It's different routes of administration. They're they're a small group that, that were used for editing, but most are not putting the gene in the genome. They just transfer a functioning gene into the nucleus, and we hope that we get enzyme production. The ex vivo are the patients who have their stem cells taken, modified in a laboratory or a production facility, and then those stem cells come back and are re-injected. Um, just like a, a transplant. So um, the exciting thing, and there's been some change in the last six months, but most of the MPS have gene therapy clinical trials running. I think if I had to list the slide of the basic science, there's probably a, a hundred that would go on there. But there, there are, at this point, uh, uh, MPS 1, 2, 3A, 6 that had, have clinical trials that are ongoing. 6 has finished their phase 3 and we're waiting to hear what the decision how to move forward. 3A, you, um, you have uh, sort of two strategies that include both the ex vivo and the in vivo. MPS 2 has ex vivo, in vivo. Right now it has just the, the two in vivo, but there, uh, there will be um, an ex vivo, and the same is true for MPS1. There's both in vivo and ex vivo. So 
Um, it's exciting. People ask which is the better method. They each have advantages, disadvantages. I don't know uh, which will uh, be supported long term. This is the paper that Mark described. It's pretty remarkable outcome. Eight patients, no deaths. Um, uh, patients were all in the young age group, so um, you uh, are treated.